Hello, everybody, and thank you for being here today. I'm Laura Kaminsky, and I'm so thrilled to be doing this event for Composers Now Impact Series. And I want to thank the entire team of Composers Now for having helped put together this program, which is about the idea of collaboration and trust in making music. And I thought about this a lot this year when we were all so isolated and writing the music that I was doing felt so much more abstract and disconnected than it does in normal times when you're making it close up with your colleagues. And so when I was thinking about this show, I wanted to bring some of my most beloved and trusted colleagues into the room with me to have a conversation about our work together and how music making is so much about a shared experience. Um, Today, also in making the decisions of who to invite, I wanted to celebrate some work that has taken place over the course of the year, two new CDs and two new operas. And I'm really thrilled to be joined today by um, pianist Ursula Oppens, with whom we spent several years putting together a CD project called Oppens Plays Kaminsky that was just released on the Sedil label uh, about a few weeks ago. And Ursula is going to join me in a little bit to talk about our long-term history of working together. I've also invited um, Kimberly Reed, who is a brilliant filmmaker and librettist, uh, with whom I've made four operas, three of whom also in collaboration with librettist Mark Campbell. But the fourth one is a new project that we wrote together that is going to be given its digital premiere by Hawaii Opera Theater in just a few weeks, and then its stage premiere next fall in Santa Fe um, with Blythe Gessert in one of the lead roles. And Blythe is a beautiful mezzo-soprano who has been involved in many of the projects that I've done in the vocal world over the last uh, eight or so years. And she is joining us at the end to talk about her work with me and also to celebrate her new CD, which is called Home, on which there is a cut, one scene from Kim's and my opera that will be premiering in Santa Fe. So that's the program that we're dealing with today. And I'm really excited and grateful to my friends for joining us. Um, I was started out by saying that, you know, composing is such an isolated activity, but in a way it's a very full activity because when I'm writing music, it's never about just those abstract notes on a page. It's never just about the rhythms or the harmonies or the melodic lines. There's always some lower level of storytelling, whether it's abstract as in instrumental music or specific as in uh, song or opera. And to me, I don't just write it as music. I very much am writing as a conversation. And so having my collaborators present with me is a very important piece of how I compose. Seeing Ursula in my mind's eye as I wrote the piano quintet for her and the Cassatt string quartet, knowing how she sits at the piano, kind of seeing her magic helped inspire the actual writing that I did. Now there's a backstory to this piece, the piano quintet, and we're gonna be hearing the first movement of it in just a moment. Um, the Piano Quintet was a commission from Ursula to create a work for her and the Cassatt String Quartet, an ensemble that I had collaborated with for many years, as had Ursula. And it was in celebration of her 75th birthday. And we were there was going to be a concert at um, Kaufman Center at Merkin Concert Hall in New York on her birthday, where we were going to premiere the piece. I wrote this piece during the midst of the Trump administration and felt it was a really dark and troubled time in our country's history. And the music was kind of reflecting that. Um, it's in three movements. We're gonna hear the first movement. The, the three movements are called Anthem, Lamentation, Coming into Light, and the third movement is Maelstrom, And. And I'll just say a bit about the first movement, which you're going to hear now. It's, uh, I lived in West Africa for over a year, and then I lived and worked in Eastern Europe for over a year. And my fascination with rhythm has led me to deep study of, of uh, West African drumming 
and also Eastern European dance rhythms. And I've been spending a lot of time in the last 20, 20 years integrating all of the beauties of those rhythmic expressions into my own language and my own music. Um, so Anthem starts out with a 13-8, sort of a drumming pattern, which would never be an African drumming pattern and would not be an Eastern European dance rhythm. It's my own, but it's kind of inspired by that notion of the layering and um, patterning of the music. And it was very hard. We'll talk about this with Ursula later to put this together because people don't think in chunks of rhythm the, in Western training. And so figuring out how to put this together in terms of playing it was interesting. But I think what you're gonna hear is that it's not so hard to hear it. So I think we're gonna just now listen to Anthem. Thank you. 
Wow. Thank you, Ursula. Why don't you join me now? That was so great. Every time I hear it, I remember the excitement of actually the trepidation of our first rehearsal um, <laughs> with the Cassatt Quartet in Monaco's living room, where you were trying to piece all of those rhythmic blocks together. Why don't we start with that? And thank you for joining us today. Oh, well, it's such a wonderful piece. And I have to say um, that, Laura, you are the person who years ago, I think nine years ago, suggested that the Cassatt and I might enjoy playing together, which we have so enormously. And we've played a, a large part of the existing repertoire and pieces that were written for us. But when we first were rehearsing this piece, you see what, this is a complicated rhythm and we play different parts of it at the same time. And we just couldn't do it. And we were playing it infinitely slowly. And then Laura said, well, maybe you it would be a little bit easier if you played it faster, faster and learn to swing a bit. And I think learning to swing was the essence of being able to play this movement. I mean, to, to feel it as a dance and not just yeah. um, parse it out as one might. I mean, say. it's so much what I learned the year that I was studying in Ghana and I would take drumming lessons every week. In fact, in honor of today, I'm wearing a blouse that was made for me in my village by Moses the tailor in 1992. Um, but I would take my daily drumming lessons and my teacher, Mofius, would say, you are not calling my name. And he would come and pound the rhythms on my shoulders until I took them into my body. But I never wrote them down. It was not never about counting those beats. And of course, you as brilliantly trained, conservatory educated, practicing musicians, count everything. And so <laughs> you were all so diligent at that first rehearsal, fitting in. Well, I come in on the third time on the and, and, and it's like, no, learn the chunk, and then you'll find the cues. But if you dance it, and you do it at rhythm, at speed, it will, it will actually start to lock in. And then you started to dance, and it was beautiful. It's a wonderful piece. For me, the piano quintet is, in a way, the most satisfying form of chamber music. And as Laura has mentioned, being a pianist also is a lonely kind of thing. You spend hours in a room by yourself. And playing chamber music is the greatest joy, really, a pianist can have. And I have to say, just a month ago, the Cassatt and I started rehearsing for a different piece, a quintet by Amy Beach. And it was the first contact I had had in a year, more than a year, with a person other than my partner, who will come up very soon, because yes. his name is Jerry Lowenthal. And the next piece we're going to hear is a forehand piece that Laura wrote for the two of us. But Playing live with the cassette, I felt I'd been let out of jail. It was so, I was so happy I couldn't, I, I just couldn't even fathom it. I, just to that point, Ursula, just a week ago, I was in Dayton, Ohio with Blythe, who was joining us later in the program, at a workshop for a new opera that um, I'm, I've composed for Dayton Opera. And I was more nervous about being in a room with people, not because of COVID, but because I thought I was going to be overcome with the emotion of actually being in a room, sharing with musicians live and, and finding the essence of the music together. It was like, that was like the scariest, most beautiful, wonderful, but scary in a way. Like, how was I going to handle it? And do we know how to talk to each other anymore? And, you know, it, it was oh, it was fantastic to be back together. So I'm so glad that you're back with the Cassats because you guys are such a brilliant quintet together. And I hope that there's a lot more music for you in the future. Why don't we just say a little bit about the other two pieces that are on our C CD, which is being released in about a week. I oh, know it was released about two weeks ago, I think, on Cedil, um, because it has the piano concerto on it, which was the first piece that I wrote for you. Um, and we premiered that in St. Petersburg, Russia in 2011. Um, and then um, 
It has the piano fantasy, which you gave the New York premiere at Barge Music about three years ago. And it led to this idea of a CD of you playing my piano music. But why don't you say a little bit about sort of the, the idea of why all these pieces? What's well, 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 about this record, which is very different from any other that I've done, is that each piece is in a different instrumental form that uses different instruments. And, and so for me, it's a real history of my relationship with Laura in, in such varied ways. Um, I think the concerto is gorgeous. The fantasy was written for someone else, but it's a huge virtuosic grand piano piece that, um, well, it's very exciting. It has element, all kinds of elements in it, um, especially jazzy ones. Again, a lot of dancing is, is in that piece. And um, yes, and of course you're going to hear Reckoning, which as a forehand piece doesn't quite explore how impossible it can be for two people at one piano. It's mainly about how possible it can be. Um, but it's very much about um, playing together with someone you're very, very close to. And so I'm gonna just jump in there because I think we're gonna listen in a minute to the first movement of Reckoning. It's called Reckoning Five Miniatures for America for Piano Four Hands. And when we knew that we wanted to do the CD together, I knew that it needed about another 10 minutes of music to make a fulsome recording. And as Ursula said, she was playing solo with an orchestra and with a chamber ensemble. And I thought, well, I don't wanna have voice and I don't wanna have a solo instrument because why would I preference one over another? But what about piano four hands, especially because her partner in life, as well as music, is one of the great pianists that we have, Jer Jerome Lowenthal. So I wrote this piece as a gift to them. Um, it's a kind of a hard piece. Again, it was written during what I think of as a very troubled time in our country's history in the world. Um, and I wrote it pretty quickly, so I wanted to write miniatures as opposed to these other sprawling pieces, the concerto and um, the fantasy are both like 20 minutes long without a break. So these are all short pieces, a little bit about a minute to two or and a half each. And the first one we're going to listen to, each title of each of the five movements is two words separated by a period. The first movement is majestic yet. The second movement, hurtling, still. The third is actually called reverie. The fourth is divided. And the fifth is perhaps a little bit of hope forward yet with a little bit of caution. So we're going to listen to Majestic Yet, the first movement. And Ursula, thank you so much for joining us today. We could talk forever, but well, I know I you I will back. look at it forever.
you got a you got a bonus. <laughs> Thank you for putting the second movement up as well. I'd like to welcome my dear friend and colleague Kimberly Reed to join us. Thank you, Kim. Um, Kim and I go back about twelve years now, or something. Um, I had an idea that I wanted to write an opera, and as somebody who had not written much, if really no vocal music to speak of, it was a sort of bizarre idea, but it stuck with me and it took a long time to find my team and my, our story. But I found Kim um, after a long search. I wanted to write an opera about a transgender person finding their true self. And that notion of truth, of course, was the subject of this talk today, this, this program today, it's really important to me. Like if you're gonna be an artist, I mean, if you're gonna be a human being, you should be honest. But if you're gonna actually dedicate your life to making art, don't do it if it's not coming from the place of deepest truth. And I was just sure that I could find a way to tell a compelling story about a transgender person finding their truth. And it took a while and I found Kim and she's here with us now. Kim, why don't we just talk a little bit about how our, our collaboration has evolved and our work with Mark on As One and other pieces, and then we'll set up what we're going to listen to. Welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. You. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here with you on this uh, important day, talking about this important stuff. I think that one of the things that I really... Um, that really resonates with me about Laura's music is that um, it's just this idea of truth. I, I always feel like I'm, the music isn't really getting in the way, the notes aren't in the way um, of this emotion. Uh, and for me, that's what uh, opera is all about. That's why I write words <laughs> as a librettist. Um, the, the libretto for As One was the first one that I had ever written. And so it was great to learn from um, and work with one of the best librettists like around, uh, Mark Campbell, our other partner in crime. Um, as Laura mentioned, we've worked on a couple of projects, this, this trio, uh, the Cam, 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 Kim, <laughs> uh, Kaminsky, Campbell, Kimberly Reed, um, uh, trio. Uh, so uh, we miss Mark today, but it's like we're also um, working on other projects uh, together in the future. Um, I One of the things I love uh, about working um, with you, Laura, is that uh, uh, you're so visual. And my background is in film. And I think I approach the world of, of opera and theater in a primarily visual way. Um, and, you know, visuals that are driven by story and drama. And I think that, that Laura, that, that you kind of approach it the same way. Um, sometimes our, our conversations, I think, are very synesthetic the ziac or whatever yes. the word uh, that comes from <laughs> synesthesia would be. Yeah, yeah. but um, yes, and, and just so often I, I feel like, um, you know, just finding different ways to serve the opera. So the piece that we're working on is so much about finding the internal truth of who these characters are, um, which is why it's so fun to talk about this stuff with you. I mean, thank you. And I mean, I just remember the first time we had an actual kind of a creative meeting and this was before we knew Mark and Mark joined us probably, I don't know, a year in, into our initial conversations. I went to your um, studio in downtown Manhattan and I said, this is like, I, this is weird. This is not the way operas are made, but I've actually cast it and I've structured it, but I don't have a story to tell. And it's for two singers playing one voice. It's like a monodrama where this character is talking to themselves about who they are. And that's all I know. But I also know that there's going to be a string quartet because I want the same kind of intimacy of these two voices, a baritone and a mezzo, a male and female voice being two sides of one person in dialogue with themselves. 
And a string quartet is all the strings together are one voice. Um, and I know that, and that's it. And I don't really know very much else about opera and we don't have a story. And you took out a pad and we started to draw. I still have some of that. And we knew that we were going to use film as the set, that we were going to enclose our or immerse our character in a cinematic world, not a physical set. And you started to imagine it and drew how there'd be these multiple screens to show the different aspects of this world of our character that still didn't exist. And so we really started from a visual place. You're absolutely right. And I think we both do that even now. I mean, in the new piece that we've just created, which we'll talk about later, Hometown to the World, so much of it was visual, the way you wrote the libretto and set up the staging within the structure of the storytelling made it easy for me to see what was gonna happen at all moments. Um, yeah, yeah, that's definitely one of the things I've learned about writing for you. Um, it is ways to, to signal that, to signal that, to trigger that visual stuff, because I think um, it, I, I don't know, it's almost like directing someone, you don't tell people what to do, you just put them in a position where they can, they can um, where you know, they're going to have a reaction to the setting that is going to be beneficial um, for the overall piece. And it, uh, it it's really, it's really fun to, to watch that work. Why, why don't you tell our, our audience a little bit about Hannah and about As One and Set Up to Know for Everybody? Yeah, it's interesting that that first conversation about this dialogue, this sort of internal dialogue within a, a person who is trans is, is something that I could, that I could relate to um, because I'm trans and because I, I think I had, and, and I don't, you know, want to make it sound like uh, we're reproducing this very binary world of like male and female, and you got to be one or the other, and you got to pick one, and you know, one day you you transition from this thing that you aren't to this thing that you are, or vice versa. Um, because I think that for all of us, and for something that I, this world that I grew up in was seeing this very binary world of gender that was overly um, reductive and just didn't have any sense of subtlety for the spectrum of, of gender that is what really exists in the world in many different levels. Um, so finding ways to have that, that dialogue, that internal dialogue, um, not between you know, male and female or left and right or black and white or this or that, but just like finding ways for that internal um, discussion, that internal monologue to locate who we are at our, deep, at our deepest selves. Um, it, I often think about it of this way of just kind of stripping things down to their essence, stripping them down to their, to their core. And I think that that's what... Um, that that's what we all do when we grow up and try to understand the world around us, um, especially this very kind of deeply inculcated world of gender and gender codes and trying to figure out who we are within that binary. I think we all go through that, that internal conversation and that's what was, um, I was so interested in investigating so, yeah, I mean, I, I'll just say that the way we began our process after we met Mark was, first of all, we opened a really nice bottle of rosé wine and started talking. Mm -hmm. And we've been doing that now for 10 years. And, and the, the wine keeps flowing and the talking keeps happening. Um, but one of the things that we did was we started to, you started to talk about your own life a little bit, although we did not want to make a biography of you. This was a made up story. And you would tell something that happened when you were a little kid and Mark would say, yeah, that resonates for me. And then you tell a story about something that happened when you were in high school and say, yeah, I felt exactly like that. And those became the benchmarks of what would make this a good story. So the scene that we're going to play now is called To Know. 
And it was so true for all three of us, although this is specific to our character, Hannah, it was that sense of discovery when you, dis when you know that you're not the only one mm -hmm. and there's a world out there with people like you in it. And I mean, I had that moment as, as a gay person, as did Mark, but you ha we have it on so many other levels in our lives as human beings that we sort of had a sense about that scene would speak. Would you just set it up a little bit in the specifics and then we'll go right to the video? Yeah, I mean, so so how do you how do you how do you put all of these kind of broad ideas into a in into a scene? Um, Mark and I um, decided to set it in a library, which is this place of discovery. Um, it's actually a little outdated because um, it's not very visual to have somebody looking something up on a computer you can't really google something at home alone <laughs> so we uh, set it in this library and our, our main character hannah um is just questing and searching to find other people who are like herself and she probably doesn't even have a name for it or know quite how it's going to fit is this is this me um so this uh, this um, this segment that you're going to hear now is is, uh, is, is called To Know. Um, and it's just about the beauty of, of, of how comforting it is to know that you're not the only one in the world in your situation, which she discovers in this. So let's watch this now. Thank you.
I'm becoming an expert on the Transvaal War. So, that was um, from the production, the premiere production by American Opera Projects at BAM in September of 2014. And that was with Sasha Cook and Kelly Markroff and the Fry Street Quartet. Steve Osgood was the music director and Ken Kazan was the um, stage director. Um, we're about to talk about our next piece, Kim, Hometown to the World, which is going to have a digital premiere with Hawaii Opera Theater in a few weeks. And then it's stage premiere uh, next fall at Santa Fe with Blythe Gessert playing one of the three roles. And I just wanna say in this whole conversation around collaboration, Blythe was hired originally by American Opera Projects to workshop as one because it was already cast for Sasha and Kelly, but Blythe was a local New York artist and AOP said she's going to be fantastic. And she has become in a way a muse for me. And I think perhaps for you too, Kim, because we've done so much work with Blythe. Um, we're glad she's joining us in a few minutes, but why don't we just jump right in and I'll let you tell us about um, Hometown to the World. Yeah, yeah. Hometown, hometown to the to World, the world is, is a, it's based on the story of true events that happened in Postville, Iowa, which is this tiny town in Northeast Iowa, um, rural place, a very agrarian economy that they have there. Uh, and the whole town is really, uh, the lifeblood of that community is a, a a, a butcher. It's a meat processing plant. And it was started by Hasidic Jews who moved out from Brooklyn um, and uh, basically started up uh, this, this very successful meat packing plant uh, that attracted uh, lots of different waves of immigrants. Uh, Russians and Ukrainians and people from Palau, they always seem to be these kind of microscopic little communities that would go there to work. And um, one of them was from small mountain villages in Guatemala um, until 2008, uh, the, in May of 2008, when uh, there was a, a very big ice raid um, that was very devastating for the community. Um, at the time, it was the largest ice raid, immigration and naturalization uh, raid that had ever been um, uh, ever been you know put in, put into effect by the United States government. They arrested about a quarter of the town. That meant about another quarter of the town left after that arrest happened. It was. Um, very traumatic event with black helicopters and huge people loaded into something they call the Cattle Congress, where they arrested everybody. Um, and they were pretty ruthless with the charges for the for the first time. Um, they didn't give people a chance to plead out. Um, they gave them the choice between two felonies, both of which would result in people being deported. And that's what happened. And this um, it had a devastating effect on this community in Postville. So this opera, Hometown to the World, uh, which is a phrase that comes from the sign on the edge of town in Postville, Postville, Hometown to the World, because um, in this tiny Iowa farming town, you have a bunch of primarily Scandinavian Lutheran farmers from Northern Europe. You have a big, huge uh, population of Hasidic Jews who, um, emigrate from really all over, but initially from Brooklyn, and then a lot of uh, Guatemalan workers who had migrated there at the time that the story takes place. So it's really about 
this mix, this beautiful mix of cultures and what can go wrong um, when you don't foster um, that, that, that glorious mix. When, and for me, it's just really uh, the, the overall piece is just a metaphor for America and this American experiment that we're going through and how we all come from somewhere, somewhere else, um, and we're all trying to figure out how to make it work together. One of the things that was a challenge for us was that when we were commissioned by Santa Fe Opera, we were told we could only have three principal singers and a chorus. And so we knew that we needed to have, and we didn't want any kind of stereotyped um, archetypal characters. What we wanted to do was find a way to bring someone from the Hasida community and someone from the Guatemalan undocumented worker community and someone from the longstanding Scandinavian farming community to actually struggle with each other against the differences of their cultures, their status, their economic and legal status in the country, what the impact of the raid did to each of them, and could they resolve across all of these obstacles and differences, a hope for a better future where a town such as Postville could function and we could become the stronger, more united global community. So it's, it's both a, a sad statement on where we are, but an aspirational statement. And the chorus, which I thought Kim chose such a beautiful opening for the piece after a pretty traumatic um, overture with images of the raid. We start with the chorus singing that um, words by Emma Lazarus from the Statue of Liberty. And that becomes a sort of a, a welcome into this horrific story of Linda Morales, whose husband and son were deported, but she is left in Postville with an ankle monitor because she had a baby born in the US. She has an empty home now and no work and is as in need of relief services. Linda Larson is a Scandinavian woman who's this uh, county commissioner who's trying to figure out how to keep this town together because with all those people gone and the industry down, they were struggling. But we needed to figure out a way to get a Hasid within that world because they're a cloistered community. So our character, Abraham Fleischman, was gay and shunned by the Hasidic community and finds himself at the mercy of the relief services who send him to Linda Morales's home where he can get shelter. And so there's a lot of tension among all these characters. The scene that we're going to listen to a little bit of is from a CD recording that Blythe Gessert, who's going to join us at the end, um, is about to release call on the theme of home. And a number of composers were invited to submit. So I asked her if Kim and I could send this song, Carne Barata. And Kim, if you would just set up the text a little bit, although they'll see the, the libretto. This is gonna be an excerpt from Carne Barata. Yeah, and this comes towards the end. Uh, what you probably need to know is just that carne barata is the translation from the Spanish of the, the phrase cheap meat. Um, the idea being the people who are the laborers who are coming uh, from so far away and are working so hard in these meat packing plants, um, which a lot of us saw during the pandemic as were some of the most vulner vulnerable um, places to work that got hit the hardest. And when they fall apart, all of a sudden America can't eat. Um, so the, um, yeah, cheap meat is the, the phrase and you'll hear that uh, referred to within the, the libretto. Um, and so in this, Linda and Linda Morales and Abraham Fleischman have had a big fight and she goes away and has a reckoning with herself. And that's where we're gonna start from the middle of this scene. So let's listen to this now, thanks. Oh! 
Life. Yeah. It's so great. And we're in the same space together. We're vaccinated. We're vaccinated. <laughs> and we spent last week or two weeks ago in Dayton, Ohio, working on our new project. But why don't you just tell us about your home CD? Because it's beautiful. Well, actually, um, you know, part of the reason that uh, we that we decided to use Carne Barata was because um, one of the things that inspired my theme of home uh, was uh, part of it was because of my own family. I have two young sons and, and we were getting ready to move. I was answering a lot of questions about what uh, home is. Um, but also at the time we were having this issue with all of, you know, and I guess it's still happening now, all of these people being separated from their families at our border. And, um, you know, it just seemed like a really good fit uh, for the theme. So, um, yeah, it's going to be coming out on May 7th. Um, there's a couple of, um, singles out already and we're really excited about it. It's eight new works by eight composers. So, and it's on the bright, shiny things label. Yes. So you can check it out because we couldn't share a little fragment of it with you today, but why don't we talk now first a minute or two about collaboration, because I have to say that the trust that I have in Blythe has helped me immensely as an artist trying to figure out how to write for the voice, which I knew nothing about. And then she was right there at the beginning and has now worked with me on several projects. And in fact, Kim and Mark and I wrote another opera called Today It Rains, um, inspired by an event in the life of Georgia O'Keeffe and Blythe was Georgia O'Keeffe. And we workshopped and premiered that in San Francisco 
about a year and a half ago. Yeah. But um, talk about how it is as a singer working with composers as you're not, you know, realizing new work and finding the truths. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's really been such a pleasure um, to be able to work with Laura and Mark and Kim and Andrea and everybody uh, multiple times because you do develop a certain level of trust and comfort where you feel like you're able to really dig in and ask the questions um, and also be able to speak up. And I think as a singer, you know, when you're being educated, you're taught this is the way we do things. And, um, you know, it's not until much later that maybe some people say, but what do you think? And, you know, how is this, you know, your, what's your contribution to this work that's been done a bazillion times? And the beauty of being able to collaborate with living composers and librettists is that you actually get to have your voice heard um, in that way. So, you know, I actually feel like I'm having some sort of impact on the development and, and construction of the work. When, when we're in rehearsal, as we were, and we're going to talk about Finding Right and mm -hmm. what it's about and who you are in that um, in a moment, but when we were in workshop 10 days ago and you would and we were we were staying at a hotel across the hall from each other and i'd say okay so what what did you think today like <laughs> you know the thing that one has to remember is that i go into that first workshop or rehearsal as i i assume this is true for um, my librettist as well really nervous like we're about to give birth to this <laughs> imperfect thing that we know is going to have to be brought up to grown up status, meaning, you know, workshopped and perfected. And we don't know what's going to work and what isn't really like right. we have a sense, but writing such a long arc piece that has to tell a story dramatically and the pacing has to be right. And you're shorthanding a lot of story detail with the least amount of words in mm -hmm. a libretto, but you have to lean in heavier on the places where there's emotional import in, or a fact that has to be clear mm. and balancing all of that within song structure, sometimes you get lost. And yeah. so, you know, sometimes like I just look at Blythe and she goes, why would I say that? <laughs> <laughs> or like, I wouldn't say it that way. Okay. And it's like, oh, I set this badly. And we work it out together. I mean, it's just, it's, <laughs> it's so beautiful and three-dimensional. So finding right, is an opera, and this is the first time um, I've done four operas thus far. And in each one, the initial idea, although not the actual story or libretto was mine, but mm -hmm. the initial idea kind of came from me, some concept or some structure for storytelling and song. This one, the librettist contacted me. Mm -hmm. The librettist had the commission, the librettist had the construct, and said, would you write the music for my story? So this was a whole new collaborative experience for me. Dayton, Ohio, among other things, is where the cash register was invented, <laughs> but it is also where the Wright brothers were from. Mm -hmm. And what most people don't know is that Orville and Wilbur Wright had a sister, Catherine Wright, and we wanted to find Wright. And so this is a, an opera that is rooted in that story, but it's told through the lens of a contemporary character who discovers Catherine Wright's gravesite and delves into her story as she's grappling with her own mishaps and misfortunes in her life. And so there are these parallel stories. You are playing Catherine Wright. Mm. And why don't you say a word or two about the workshop and then set up the scene we're gonna watch. Okay. Um, well, first of all, being in a room, I, you know, with everybody and being able to sing with other people was like magical after 15 months. Um, it was, uh, it was really great. And it was such a wonderful collaborative environment. You know, we, uh, had, you know, uh, everybody in the room, you know, the director, the librettist, the conductor, everybody, um, you know, is able to contribute something, which is uh, really important. Um, 
And one of the one of the best parts, and when Laura asked me like what what excerpt I I, I thought would be good, um, was this particular scene, which is um, Isabel, is uh, Harry's first wife, and then later marries uh, Catherine, and um, she is dying, and is expressing her fear of of that you know happening, and what am I going to do, and what is going to happen to you know to Harry and to our son and um having experienced a lot of loss uh in her own life um you know her parents her her brother Catherine says you know all I can tell you is what I know and you know you just have to be in the moment and and live and love and I think um you know right now with everything that's happened uh, in the past, you know, 15 months, I think uh, that's something that we can all identify with. So I will just preface this that this was a workshop. It was the first time we read through everything. There was no um, sound modulation. The piano is too close to the mics. <laughs> There's mistakes happening. That's the and and I have to say I appreciate. I mean, you sang beautifully, but none of this is perfect. It's a workshop and it will be perfect when it premieres in Dayton in February of 2022. So exciting. But this is a little bit of Catherine's aria singing to Isabel. Thank you. And by thank you. And thank, thank you all you. for joining us today um, because this will be the last thing we're hearing. So enjoy. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.